All right. Good evening to everybody. Hope everybody is doing uh, wonderful. Um, as we get going tonight, um, I want to start out and ask what I have been asking at the beginning of my classes. What is the summary for 2 Corinthians? What is the message? Yep. Good. Very good. He defends himself, and he does it for the Corinthians' sake, right? So Paul defends himself for the Corinthians' sake. And so we're now in the final section of the book, and so that's chapters 10 through 13. And we saw a shift in Paul's tone once we get into this final section that he was not as conciliatory and diplomatic but he becomes a bit more abrasive and sarcastic, and his language is a bit more aggressive than it had been. And I believe that's because he's mainly addressing those who were really convinced of these false apostles. And he talks a lot about those false apostles. And he decides in this section that he's going to kind of play their game, their game of boasting. But he's going to kind of turn that concept on its head. And when he boasts, it's like, that's not what you would expect somebody to boast about, especially an apostle. So we saw in chapter 10 that he dispels the notion that, you know, he's different in person than he is by letter. What were they saying he's like in person? Weak. Unimpressive, weak, meek. Uh, what was he like in his letters? strong and bold and weighty. And so Paul says, no, actually, I am the same in person as I am in my letters. In other words, I don't want to have to be bold, but if you force me to be, then I will have to be. And that needs to be, you know, our, our attitude that we don't ever want to have to, to come down hard on someone, but, but Paul's saying, I will if I need to. He then rebukes those in chapter 10 who boast beyond their measure, you know, boasting in other men's labors. Paul's not willing to do that. And then in chapter 11, Paul begins by warning them against being deceived, against being duped by these false apostles and accepting a, a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel altogether. So that tells you what kind of message these false apostles are pushing. Um, Paul then answers the criticism, a weird criticism, what, what was kind of the, the weird criticism that you would never think would be a criticism that he has to really emphasize? Anybody remember? Take money from us. Yeah, you didn't take, you didn't accept money from us. And so they find all ways to, a, a lot of different areas to uh, criticize him for, for not accepting money from them. And we're going to, he's going to talk about that more in what we're going to study tonight. Uh, and then Paul lists his own credentials, starting with some credentials that maybe the false apostles would even list, like their Jewish heritage and so forth. But then he starts listing his credentials of suffering, things that they would never have, have boasted about. But he's saying the things that, that I'm going to boast about are my weaknesses, showing the mind and the mentality of Christ. And uh, that's the true that shows his true colors, and those are his real credentials, is that he has the mind, the mentality, the attitude of his, his suffering Savior, which is what we, we must have. Uh, of all the books that I've taught and studied, this one has challenged me more than any in terms of examining myself. We're going to talk about that tonight. Do I really have that mentality? I just don't suffer very much for Christ. Um, the, the false apostles, I don't think they suffered much for Christ. I don't think most of us suffer much for Christ. And I think we need to examine ourselves. I know I do. So in 12 and 13, as we wrap up the book, he's going to give some more apostolic credentials. And he's going to help prepare them for his next visit. So as we start here in chapter 12, I want to read verses 1 through 6. This is incredible. He says, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body I do not know, God knows, 
was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. So the first thing he says is boasting is not profitable. It's of no use. But I'm going to go ahead and do it. Because I'm playing this game, and so if they boast, I'm going to boast. By the way, do you think they probably, these false apostles, boasted about visions and revelations? And so he's likely saying, okay, they're boasting about visions and revelations. Let me, boast, let me boast about a vision or revelation. And by the way, of all visions and revelations a person could have, one where you are actually caught up into paradise, would that not be the pinnacle of all kinds of, uh, of visions a person could, could possibly have? So he's topping anything that they could say, but then he's doing it in a way that you might not expect. Uh, first of all, he doesn't refer to himself in the first person. He refers to himself in the third person. Um, why, do you think he, why do you think he does that? Why is he referring to himself in the third person? He doesn't want to seem like he's bragging. Yeah, he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. Um, how, now, how do we know that he is referring to himself? Maybe he's talking about some other guy that was caught up in the paradise. Well, do you notice the shift from the... Third person back to the uh, first person in, in verse uh, 5 and, and verse 6. And then especially we're going to see in verse 7, it becomes exceedingly clear he is talking about himself having this, this vision. So he's, try, he's, he's being humble. He's, it, he's uh, reticent to go about boasting about this. He's so humble, it's hard for him to even say it, Right? Whereas these false apostles are probably blabbering about all of their visions and revelations and giving all the, the juicy details. You know, I think of the, that book uh, uh, that came out a little, like Heaven is for Real. Like, I guess some little boy was supposed to have seen all this stuff and a, a movie was made. And then the, the boy, when he was older, said, well, I made all that stuff up. Uh, you, you know, all the, uh, every detail. Do people wear glasses in heaven? Whatever. Paul is... Paul is saying, look, I was caught up into paradise. I was caught up into the third heaven. You know, for, to the Jews, the first heaven is like where the, where the clouds are and everything. And the second heaven is where the stars and everything are. And the third heaven is beyond that where, where God dwells. Uh, I was caught up into that. I was caught up into paradise. But then he doesn't really give us any details. He doesn't even know if he was in the body or not. Now, by the way, it was that vivid. He wasn't even sure if he was in the body or not. Um, he heard words, but what does he call them? Inexpressible. He couldn't even tell them really what he'd heard. And so he gives very, it's almost frustrating. It's like, but no, Paul, give me more. I want we want to hear more. But Paul's saying, I think the reason he's giving so few details, he's being so vague, is because he's saying this is not where the emphasis should be on my having some vision and revelation. These, you want these spectacular things, Corinthians. That's what you're so attracted to. That's what people today are so drawn to, is all the flash. He's saying that's not what's, what's important. But let me pause here. Can you imagine being caught up into paradise? And, and being there and seeing the glory and hearing whatever inexpressible words. I don't know if this was God speaking to him. I don't know why he received this, this vision. Um, but can you just imagine what that would do to you? To actually get up, to, to go up into heaven and come back down to earth and to have actually seen it. And I just think we need to live like people that have already seen it. Like... It's that real to us, and we're that motivated and driven. That would have just, and maybe that's why he was given this vision to help motivate him, to help drive him. Maybe God had things to speak to him, as he did to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six. 
uh, and some lesson for Paul. This was 14 years before. The time of the writing of 2 Corinthians is about 57 uh, AD. And so this is, uh, you know, about 43 BC. It's a during a, I mean, AD. It's in time of Paul's life that the book of Acts doesn't really give us any detail about. You know, it was after he was, he's converted, but there's like a 10 year period before he like starts into his journeys and everything that we just don't have details about. And so it would be in that time period that he had this, this revelation that happened 14 years ago. Apparently, this is the first time he's even told the Corinthians about it, whereas the false apostles are just uh, going on and on, droning, about, droning on and on, maybe, about their, their various visions of revelation. Some of that speculation that I don't know, but uh, Paul said, this happened 14 years ago, and this is the first time you're hearing about it. Uh, this is not where the emphasis should be, is on things, is on things like this. And so he's saying basically there in verse 6 that these aren't the kinds of things that he wants to boast about because he wants people to uh, credit him with what they see and what they hear. You can't see or hear these visions someone tells you about. He wants them to credit, credit him with things they can see and hear. And what do they see and what do they hear in Paul? Christ. Everything for Paul comes back to the gospel. Uh, and so that's what he wants the emphasis to be, not on him. And he had many, many revelations. So as we go, and, and any thoughts on that before I kind of move forward a little bit? All right, so in verses 7 through 10, let's read. Paul says, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation." For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that, he might, that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, you'll notice at the beginning of verse 7, he calls, he says that he has had many revelations. He said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, plural. So he just gave us one example. We can all think of another, another revelation he had, uh, another vision he had, and what is that? Yeah, on the road to Damascus, when he saw the Lord. So he could have talked about others, but he talked about this one example, I think, because that would be kind of like the pinnacle of, of a vision to be caught up into, into paradise. But he says, to keep me from exalting myself, I was given this thorn in the flesh. Now, what do you think the false apostles were you know, doing with these visions and revelations? Exalting themselves. And they were puffed up about this. Paul was not puffed up about it. God had made sure to keep him humble by allowing him to have this thorn in the flesh. It doesn't say God sent it to him. It says it's a messenger of whom? It's a messenger of Satan, but God's going to use this messenger of Satan that will torment Paul, but to use it for God's glory. God can do that. He can allow Satan to do things that are not fun and pleasant, but God is using those things that Satan's intending to, to ruin us to actually strengthen us and help us trust in him. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty mind-boggling, really, when, when, you, when you think about it that way. What was the thorn in the flesh? Does anybody know? What do you think it could have been? What are some thoughts on that? Maybe a physical malady? Did Paul have some uh, physical maladies? He'd been beaten into a bloody pulp on a lot of occasions. Uh, he told the Galatians, uh, uh, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me if you could have. Some people you know, speculate that, well, maybe he had an eye problem, and maybe that's something he's referring to here, some kind of physical issue like that. It could have been an emotional issue. 
Uh, it could have been any number of things, but it was clearly something, and I tend to think it was something physical, the way that he refers to it as a thorn in the flesh. He wanted it gone. And uh, we can relate. Have you ever had a thorn in the flesh that you just begged God to remove from your life? And God's answer is no. You're going to have to stick with this thorn in the flesh. Can we all relate to that? What are some thorns in the flesh that we might want removed that maybe they don't get removed? I don't, I've thought about this for many years. Yeah. I'm wish, I'm like, you know, wish, you know, I don't know how a, something from Satan is going to be strictly physical. How something what? Something from Satan is going to be strictly physical. Okay. Uh, so I look at it as a spiritual issue. Okay. I know it is. I'm just saying. I've heard blindness and some other things. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen this. But if it's a messenger from Satan, mm-hmm. then it seems like it's going to be something to be a struggle with spiritual you know, Okay. So what Herb is saying is he he struggles to see how this could could be anything physical because it's a messenger of Satan, and that sounds like it would be like a a, a spiritual sort of a thing. Um, but you know, I think of like the lady who has been over for so many years that Jesus healed, and uh, maybe it's Luke 12, I can't remember exactly, but it's uh, that Satan had afflicted her with that physical malady. And Jesus' healing of people who had physical maladies was showing dominance and power over Satan. Um, And so I, I do think that, personally, I think that Satan can work in us in a physical way so that that physical thing can affect us spiritually, if that makes sense. So it might not be a purely spiritual matter, maybe physical, but boy, that, f- that physical thing, it can make you turn from the Lord. It can make you doubt the Lord and uh, so forth. So I have a little different attitude on that, but I, I see where you're coming from that. But you, and you may be right. It may not have been something physical. So we just don't know. Tim? Do you think that maybe one of the things we want to walk away from this is that it's something that, that they couldn't take care of on their own? I mean, he's turning to God. It's something that he can't... He can't take care of on his own. He can't take care of it on his own. And, you know, so he's turning to the right place, but he's he's giving a a no for... And a no for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Charles? To answer your original question, I I think for me, one of the challenges or one of the thorns in the flesh that uh, that I would say I'm currently being struggled with would probably be pride. Mm. That aspect of pride in that, that can be a thorn in the flesh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be it could be pride. Um, it could be certain people in your life. <laughs> you might, we might even say this person's a thorn in my side, <laughs> and that saying actually comes from this. You know, um, it could it it could be some kind of physical struggle or sickness that we want gone. It's hard hard for us to to uh, live the normal kind of life that we'd like to live. So, yeah, I think we can all relate to that. What did you going to say? Yes, ma'am? I was thinking of Joe. Um, yeah. He had physical things hit by him. And yes. God said, you know, that Satan could touch him, but mm. not, you know, right. kill him. And he, he touched him in many physical ways as right. well as mental. That's right. God allowed <laughs> Satan to afflict Job in, in lots of ways, and he had a lot of physical suffering. And so we can relate to that. And we can relate to going to God and, and asking for him to remove things and they not get removed. That shouldn't affect our faith in him. For Paul, it taught him a lesson. And what was the lesson? God's grace is made perfect in weakness, right? Um, when we are weak, that causes us to realize it's only Christ who's going to get us through. And that's a humbling thing. Whereas before we might rely on ourselves, we're forced to rely on God because of our weaknesses. And so there are things to, to be brought out. Yes, sir? It's kind of an interesting term when you think about it, especially in the context of chapter 11. You know, we're used to think of a thorn in the side as being a really bad thing. Right. But this is a man who was stoned, beaten with rods, shipwrecked, yeah. on and on he goes. And then he goes to God with help with a thorn in his side. You know, I was able to put up with all this other stuff. Right. Why can't you just do this little thing for me? Yeah. And, and it always seems like we're asking God to play fair with us. 
And sometimes the answer is no. Right. And right. we get angry with that, and Paul finds strength in that. Yeah. And that speaks to his character. It's okay to ask for help yeah. with these right. problems. Right. But if God's idea is different, then we have to be at peace with that. We, and that's the hard part, isn't it? Uh, and it's not just being at peace with it. You're absolutely right. But to say even more about Paul's mature attitude, look at what he says at the beginning of verse 10. Therefore, I am what? Well content. I am well content with weaknesses, with, with insults, and so forth, for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, there I'm strong. He's saying, I'm more than happy. If it's going to strengthen me and help me to trust in the Lord more, and it's going to make me a, a better servant of Christ, then bring it on. I'm, I'm happy to accept it. That is an attitude that is hard for me to, to have. I'll just be honest. I want to have that attitude. I'm challenged to be better by studying this, and we all are. So good, good comments, everybody. In uh, the next section, Paul talks about how we have treated you right. Uh, he says in verses 11 through 13, I should have been commended by you. You should have stood up for me. Basically, you should be ashamed. You, I mean, you saw the signs of a true apostle. True miracle. Now, he doesn't say the signs of just an apostle. He says true apostle because maybe these false apostles had their signs. But he's saying you saw the signs of only a true apostle and, uh, and you still aren't commending me. You still don't believe in me. And he says you were never treated as inferior. You think you were treated as inferior because I didn't take money from you and I wasn't a burden on you? Forgive me this wrong, he says at the end of verse 13. I mean, the sarcasm is just very, very strong there. In verses 14 and 15, he says, I'm coming to you now for a third time. You see him saying that at the beginning of verse 14. And back when I started this whole study on 2 Corinthians, I, I was still trying to make up my mind what I, what I thought about the, the visits. And, uh, because the, the book of Acts only records up to this point one visit. That's Paul's visit in the second missionary journey that's recorded uh, in Acts 18. And so he's, gonna, he's about to make his second visit uh, to, to Corinth. But um, at this point, only one is recorded, and there's no second visit in between that is recorded. So I was struggling with that. But when I get to this part and Paul just says, I'm coming a third time, I just think that I have to take that at face value. Acts doesn't record every trip that Paul makes and every little detail. So... I think there had to be at least some sort of like short trip at least that Paul had made to Corinth in between, um, you know, basically the writing of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And notice he says there in verse 14 toward the middle, he says, For I do not seek what is yours but you. Don't you love that? I'm not coming for your money. That's what the false apostles are after. I'm not after about what is yours. I'm after you. What does he mean when he says, I'm after you? What's he saying? What's he want? Their love, their, their, love, their heart. He, he, he wants their salvation, ultimately. And that should be what, what motivates us as well. Uh, he says in verse 15, I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Isn't that kind of heartbreaking? It's like everything that Paul is doing to try to show them deferential treatment and, and love and, and self-sacrifice for their good, uh, preferential treatment, all these things, they're twisting all of that and loving him less the more he tries to show his love for them. Have we experienced that in, in life? This unrequited love that, uh, that just breaks our heart? Yes. But I love what he says. I will most glad. There we see that most gladly again. I am more than happy to spend and be spent. Now, what, what, is, what does he mean when he, says, when he says, I'm willing to spend? What is he willing to spend for them? Time? What else? What else is he willing to spend? His blood. His blood, literally. 
himself, his energy, his, his, energy, resources. his resources. He's spending his own money. Everything that he's got. Everything that he's got. And that's why the next thing he says is not just to spend, but to be spent. I'm willing to be exhausted. It's the only time this particular Greek word is used, uh, and it means to give out completely. It means to be utterly spent. Reminds me of in Philippians 2 when Paul says, I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering for you. Uh, or if I am poured out as a drink offering to you. I'm, I'm happy to do that. I'm willing to do that. So what an attitude we ought to have for one another and our service to one another to just be willing to empty ourselves out, to just give it all uh, for, for one another. Because of our love, uh, our love for one another. All right, in verses 16 through 18, Paul says, I, I have not taken advantage of you, nor has anybody that I have sent to you. These false apostles, they're taking advantage of you, but I'm not going to do that, and I have not done that. And then verse 19, I think this is a key verse in this chapter. I mean the whole book. He says, all this time you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. So this is one of those key verses where I get the takeaway of the whole book that Paul defends himself for the Corinthians' sake. When we defend ourselves, what do we often do it for? What are the reasons? <laughs> Prove a point. Pride, want to save face. You know, uh, we do it for our own reputation. Paul is saying, we're not actually, you think we're defending ourselves, but everything we're saying is for your benefit. It, because if they don't have the right attitude about Paul, they're not going to have a right attitude about the gospel that he's preaching. And if they don't regard his spirit of self-sacrifice and of meekness and humility, and they're going to, you know, throw him under the bus for that, then how in the world are they going to have the right regard for Jesus and his humility and his self-sacrifice? So I think that's, that's the point as well. In verses 20 and 21, Paul says, I, I'm afraid. I, I'm genuinely afraid that I might be disappointed when I come to visit you again. And he, he lists off some sins. First of all, at the end of verse 20, he lists off strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. Do you notice how those all really have to do with our dealings with one another? The sorts of sins that were happening that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians. Um, but then look at the end of verse 21. He's concerned about also sins of impurity immorality and sensuality. To be a Corinthian, as you know, was to be one who practiced sexual immorality. And so he's concerned that they still have that going on. And that when he shows up, he's just, it's just going to be uh, sorrowful for him. He's concerned. He's, he's kind of protecting himself a little bit here too. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to experience that. So he's urging them to, uh, to repent. That would have been very motivating so that they don't disappoint him. You know, sometimes I have found that that, that motivation alone just uh, is, is so powerful when dealing with other people. Um, people. People like to live up to expectations. They don't like to let, let somebody that they think a lot of let, let them down. So that's chapter, tw uh, chapter 12. So here's my summary of chapter 12, then we'll open up for comments. Paul's Paul is saying in this chapter, I too can boast about visions and revelations, though such boasting is useless. I will rather boast about my weaknesses. You have no excuse for rejecting me. I am coming to you again and will seek your best interests as I always have done. When I arrive, please don't let me find you still living in sin. All right. Any uh, comments or questions from chapter 12? I'm going a little faster than I'd planned because I'm not getting, I'm not sparking enough conversation. Tim? I was going to say the, the, when you made the comment about um, I'm not seeking what is yours, but I'm, I'm seeking you. I heard something uh, said this week and it made me think of that, that 
he so desperately wants them to see him the way he sees them. Mm -hmm. You know, he loves them, and he's doing this, and they're not they're not seeing it. They're being deceived a little bit here, I think, by yeah. these false apostles. But that's what he's really going after here. He's going to continue with that when we get to the next chapter. He's going to bring up something that is saying, look, you know, third time, this is a, a, a what he's doing everything he can. Not one time, not two times, not three times. Right, right. And he's going to hit where they understand that, too. Because that's what he wants them to see in him. He wants to be seen by them the way yeah. that he sees them. Yeah, in fact, another really good theme verse for the book is in 611. In chapter 6 and uh, verse 11, Our mouth has spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You're not restrained by us, but you're restrained by your own affections. Now in like exchange, I speak as to children, open wide to us also. He's wanting this like exchange. He wanted them to have the, the same attitude. And You know, another good summary for the book is a heart opened wide. And we can sum it up, Paul defends himself for the Corinthians. But you could also sum it up that way, a heart opened wide that wants their heart opened wide. Very good. Charles. It's fascinating. Really what you just said has me uh, kind of thinking. It's from like a leader's perspective. Like, you know, as a leader, especially Paul in his example, his heart actually is just for the people. Yeah. But a lot of the times, you know, even when you saw Christ, you know, have a heart for the people, but yet people ended up turning, you know, turning mm -hmm. their hearts away from Christ in yeah. a certain moment. So it's, it's interesting to see that dynamic, you know, again, just add that leadership up, and we can see it in modern times, like, you know, just a particular leader taking a second stance, and people who love him for a current season, but, you know, one season may yeah. change, and then they, you know, they hate the guy, or they yeah. hate the leader. But it's just, you know, I, that's the piece I'm just kind of picking up on, just that commonality between leadership and having that wide-open heart yeah. for the people in compared to the leaders who have more of a closed-off heart that they kind of rule with more of an iron fist type of uh, style. You know, what that brings to my mind is something I just realized it's probably a, a not, not the right attitude for me to have, but I've often said, and I thought it sounded so good and so smart that I help people who want to be helped as much as I want to help them. And the point of that is like in evangelism. If somebody's showing they don't really want my help, well, all right, I'll just move on to somebody else. And maybe there's some truth to that. But I think we need to be careful that we don't just sort of write people off because they're not as open to our help as we are to giving it. Because here Paul is pouring himself into these people who at this moment are saying, we don't really want you, Paul. At least some of them were. And he's willing to keep going with that to, to try to win them over. Sometimes we, as leaders, we have to be persistent and keep pouring into people and not give up so quickly. Well, they didn't want it, so I'm going to move on. I'll find somebody else who, who, who's, who's open and who, who wants to return that love. You know, I just know, for me, I give up too easily. Paul's, <laughs> he's not a quitter, and that's a sign of a, of a very strong leader. Brian? And then over. Yeah, I Phil? Think it's so relationship and community. Yeah. You could have easily just, you know, thrown down some tablets, you know, thou shalt not boast in false visions, you know, thou shalt not, you know, mislead a church and claim to be a false apostle. That would not be good. You know, like he could just, you know, give command after command after command. Yeah. And instead, it's like the word is living in people, in Paul, yes. and yes. through the Corinthians and through their relationship together. Yes. And that helps us, I think, understand God's vision for his people is to yeah. not just be isolated islands off themselves memorizing right. scripture but to be living that out in the community yeah. of the church exactly and you know in chapter 3 how does Paul define this new covenant ministry it's a spirit ministry it's and when we have the spirit of Christ and that's what this letter has been helping me to understand is the mentality the approach of Jesus like literally taking that very thought process of Jesus of putting other people's needs first and sacrificing himself all the way to the cross and putting that very thought process into us. We don't have to have a list of commandments of this, this is what you shall do and this is what you shall not do in terms of how to treat one another. 
we have that spirit. Now, we do have commandments, but when, when we have that spirit and we understand that we filter everything through that spirit of Christ working through us, it will affect everything we say and do and think. And, uh, and that's the challenge. That's the challenge. All right, we got five minutes. Phil? What I find in chapter 12 throughout the whole book is we are God-made, not self-made. Yeah. And Paul says later, we're God's workmanship in Christ. God knows exactly what he wants here mm. to be done in us. Yes. And this work is so big that really only God can do it. Yeah. Now, the teaching, Paul says, has a purpose. First Timothy 1 5. Mm -hmm. The goal or aim of all instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. Mm -hmm. So teaching will buttress that, but mm -hmm. really the hand of God is going to be at work, and it's a hand of grace. Right. And what he's really trying to get us prepared for is to come home and live continually as a companion to God in grace. Mm -hmm. Where we don't feel like we don't belong because we never did enough. We didn't work hard enough. We didn't whatever the thing is. And that's where most of us get caught. Mm -hmm. We think we've got to somehow work and earn something in this relationship so we can feel justified mm -hmm. in being there with me. Yeah. And God yeah. says, no, it's 100% grace. Right. And you will, right. it will always be that way throughout eternity. Yeah. And yeah. you're not going to change that. But God will perfect this later for Peter 5.10. He'll, yeah. he'll do all that finishing work that we can't do for ourselves. My grace is sufficient. Oh. Right. Amen. Okay, in chapter 13... We're, this one's a lot shorter. Uh, we're not going to go into as much depth here. Uh, Paul says in the first four verses, this is the third time that I'm coming to you. And this time, I'm not going to spare anyone so that you will know that it is Christ who speaks in me. Remember at the end of chapter 1, he had said, I, I changed my travel plans to spare you. Now he's saying, I ain't going to spare you. <laughs> the, the time of waiting is over. And he's ready to punish all disobedience. Uh, as, he, as he said in chapter 10 and verse 6, which would involve, I think, at the very minimal, um, you know, withdrawal of fellowship and church discipline. He's ready to do that. So he warns them in verses 5 and 6, test yourselves. Verse 5, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. He, um, it was kind of ironic because who did they think was being tested right now? Paul, you're in the microscope. Paul's saying, no, you're the ones being tested. So you test yourself so you don't fail the test. Make sure Christ is in you, that spirit, that mentality, that attitude. Absolutely. And we need to examine ourselves constantly. Are we really, truly Christ's apprentices, His followers. Are we really living as if Christ is in us, uh, in control of, of, our, of our bodies and our minds? Uh, verses 7 through 10, Paul reminds him again, my motive is totally selfless. I do every, everything for your benefit. He says in verse 7, Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. He's saying, ultimately, it doesn't matter what people think of me as long as they end up doing what's right. That's all I really care about. So selfless. He takes himself out of it, and it's all about the gospel. It's all about people's salvation. It should be for us as well. In the conclusion, uh, he says in 11 through 14, finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete. He, he had also said that at the end of verse 9. So be made complete. Be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I think that verse 14 is so beautiful and, and profound. So to sum up chapter 13, he says, On this visit I will spare no one, so test yourselves. The only thing I care about is your spiritual well-being, so please... Be made complete. So that's 2 Corinthians. Paul defends himself uh, for the Corinthians' sake. A heart opened wide. Hope the study has been beneficial uh, for everybody. Herb, did you have something? Oh, I, I thought I saw you. If you're through. Sorry? I said if you're through. 
Yeah. I'm through. I didn't want to run. You got 15 Paul seconds. Said in verse, uh, uh, verse 9, uh -huh. restoration is what we pray for. I just love that. Your restoration. Your restoration. I like that version. Yeah, that's ultimately what he really wanted is restoration. Of his relationship to them, but ultimately their relationship to, to God. Yeah. All right, very good. Please read through page 169A uh, and the corresponding scriptures for Sunday. This is my last class. It's my last class before Dwayne comes. So I've enjoyed it.